Welcome to the final talk in this year's iSchool Colloquium series. Uh, I want to acknowledge as we begin that each time, this time and each time we've met here for these really excellent and engaging talks, we have been meeting on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Hunkameenan people. And I'm very grateful that we're able to have these types of conversation in this space. Um, my name is Jennifer Douglas. I am an assistant professor at um, the iSchool here, and this is maybe the second time in the whole series that I've remembered to introduce myself. Uh, with uh, Dr. Julia Bullard, I am the co-coordinator of the colloquium series this year, and we are very pleased to have as our final speaker for the term in the year um, Dr. Ms. Michelle Caswell with us. Michelle Caswell is an associate professor, uh, ooh, assistant professor of archival studies in the Department of Information Studies at the University of California, Los Angeles, where she is also an affiliated faculty member with the Department of Asian American Studies and the Center for Southeast Asian Studies. Dr. Caswell holds a PhD in Information Studies from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and an MLIS with an archives concentration from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Dr. Caswell's research on archives, memory, public history, social justice, community archives, and archival education has been widely cited in a range of fields. Her book, Archiving the Unspeakable, Silence, Memory, and the Photographic Record in Cambodia, won the 2015 Waldo Gifford Leland Award for Best Publication from the Society of American Archivists. And in 2016, Dr. Caswell was awarded a three-year early career arch uh, research grant from the IMLS to study the users of community-based archives in Southern California. Dr. Caswell is also the co-founder of the South Asian American Digital Archives, an online repository which documents and provides access to the diverse stories of South Asian Americans. Uh, in 2016, Michelle was also a member of the U.S. delegation to the Mandela Dialogues on Memory Work, a program that's organized by the Nelson Mandela Foundation in South Africa and the German Global Leadership, Leadership Academy that convenes an international dialogue series for thought leaders and change agents in the field of memory work. Dr. Caswell's talk today is titled, Now More Than Ever, Community Archives, Activism and Disrupting Time. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Caswell. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Jennifer, for the invitation and for that really wonderful introduction. Um, I'm so excited to be here. Um, you're all so lucky to have Jennifer here as well. Um, the title of my talk, as Jennifer said, is Now More Than Ever, Community Archives, Activism, and Disrupting Time. So this is new material for me that I hope to turn into my next book next year when I'm on sabbatical. So I'm really eager to get your feedback. Um, and questions at the end, and also to see um, if what I'm saying holds up or is different in a Canadian context. So I want to begin by talking about time, and then I'll move on to sharing some empirical data my research team at UCLA, UCLA and I collected about how members of marginalized communities, and we're talking specifically here about people of color and LGBTQ communities, see community-based archival labor as an intervention in time more specifically as a disruption in the ways in which oppressive histories repeat themselves. And then I'm going to draw on my own experiences as an educator and an archivist for the South Asian American Digital Archive to argue that archivists have an ethical imperative to use their skills and knowledge and labor to disrupt white supremacy and patriarchy in ways that challenge and go beyond the standard liberal archival solutions of diverse collecting and inclusive description. Those are band-aid solutions, and I think we need seismic structural shifts. In so doing, I'll conclude by arguing that such disruptions are neither about the past nor the future, but about the now. That is the liberatory affects and effects of archival labor in the present. So I'm both a social scientist who empirically studies the world as it is, and a humanities scholar who critiques that world and builds theory that imagines new worlds and new ways of being in this world. So I'm wearing both of those hats today, and I'll switch back and forth between humanities and social scientists. Um, I'd also like to issue the caveat that I am hopelessly American, and the data that I report on emerges from the American context. Um, and again, I'm really eager to get your feedback in the Q&A about this. Um, so I have a lot to say in the next 35 minutes or so, so I'm going to get started. I want to begin by talking about time. So I started my academic career as a religion major at Columbia University in New York, focusing on South Asian religions. And I later went on to get a master's of theological studies from Harvard Divinity School, also focusing on South Asian religions. 
One of the first things you learn when you study Hinduism or Buddhism is that for a great portion of the world, for a great portion of history, many people have not and do not currently see time as a linear progression. That's in fact a very Western, very Christian way of viewing the world. So for example, in a Christian view, we have time plodding along at pace um, to reach the culminating event of Jesus' birth. And then it plots along in a linear fashion until eventually we reach the apocalypse, which these days seems much closer than it did when I was a religion major 20 years ago. Um, but that is not how time is conceived in Hinduism, for example. Um, and I'm speaking specifically about Hinduism because that's um, what I know most about, right? So in Hinduism, time is cyclical. Things happen and then they happen again. There are four yugas or epics within each cycle of time, the longest lasting 1,728,000 years and the shortest lasting 432,000 years. And things get progressively worse as we go through each age. There's a decline in virtue as you go through each four age cycle. So in the first age, uh, it's characterized by truth and unity and people live to be 100,000 years old. Um, and then it progressively gets worse through the ages until you get to the Kali Yuga, characterized by greed and ignorance, um, and people only live 100 years maximum, and everything is war and destruction and environmental degradation and poverty. So this is the age we live in now by Hindu estimations. At the end of the Kali Yuga, the god Vishnu comes as Kalki riding a horse, killing the bad guys, destroying the world. But then time doesn't end there. The whole thing repeats itself ad infinitum. 1,000 of these cycles is just one day in the life of Brahma, the creator god. And he lives to be like 315 trillion years old. And even then, there's a dissolution for a while, but then the whole thing starts up again, cyclically. So that's a long digression to show how there are many ways of thinking of time. And our dominant Western linear progress narrative is only one of many. I want to talk about that quote that was first formulated by a Unitarian minister, Theodore Parker, and made famous by Dr. King, that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. That's a very linear, very Christian way of viewing the world. Um, I think we can make some basic observations based on our current historical, cultural, social, political moment, at least in the American context, that it does not. That the arc of the moral universe does not necessarily bend toward justice that instead we are witnessing cycles of oppression, two steps forward, two steps back. Progress is not the default. Liberation is not the fallback of the system, however slow liberals might say it takes to get there. Instead, our systems are built to oppress. Our institutions are designed to perpetuate white supremacy and heteropatriarchy, and they are very good at doing that. And they do this in a cyclical way. We may have thought we were making small but steady progressive steps, liberal steps, reforming steps, but then crash. Too much pressure on the system and it pulls back. Without dismantling the system, the system clamps back down to ensure it fulfills its oppressive design in cycles. Without a systemic intervention in dismantling the oppression at its root, without a full stop and redesign, the oppressive systems continue by design. History repeats itself. So that's where we find ourselves right now. Again, speaking from an American context, depending on how you situate yourself, it feels like 1964 all over again, or 1932 all over again, or even 1859 all over again. And in fact, that's what the empirical data shows. Um, more specifically, the focus groups that my research team and I conducted with people of color and LGBTQ folks who use community archives in Southern California revealed the ways in which marginalized people see history repeating itself and the hopes they have that archival labor, including their own volunteer labor, will intervene on that repetition. So as Jennifer said, I received an early career grant from the US Institute of Museum and Library Services to study the impact of community archives on the communities they serve and represent in Southern California. Thanks to that grant and support from UCLA, I was able to assemble a fantastic research team last year. Doctoral students Joyce Gabiola and Grayson Brillmeyer and MLIS student Jimmy Zavala, and I really want to acknowledge their labor. Um, we conducted 10 focus groups with 54 community members at five different community archive sites in Southern California. The Southeast Asia Archive at UC Irvine, which represents Vietnamese, Laotian, and Cambodian American refugee and immigrant communities. The Little Tokyo Historical Society, which represents descendants of Japanese Americans who were forcibly removed from downtown Los Angeles during World War II and incarcerated in camps. 
Lambda Archives in San Diego, which is a gay and lesbian archives. La Historia Society, which represents what until very recently was a Mexican-American farm working community in East Los Angeles. And the Studio for Southern California History, which is a public history organization that does oral histories from the bottom up. So these are community archive sites where people who have been left out of mainstream archives take it upon themselves, take it into their own hands to document their own histories. Um, I prefer the more specific term marginalized identity-based community archives, but that is extremely clunky. So I'm using community archives here as a shorthand. So these focus groups that we did, we're trying to get at the emotional and psychosocial impact of seeing yourself represented in a community archive after being symbolically annihilated, that is misrepresented, underrepresented, or absent in mainstream media and archives. And they did get at that, right? We did find that these community archives encourage what we call representational belonging, right? Which are complex feelings of seeing yourself represented. It's an affective response. And that these organizations were having what we call an epistemological, ontological, and social impact on the communities they serve and represent. But some other very interesting themes surfaced, including this prevailing sense across communities and organizations that history was repeating itself, that the historic trauma communities had suffered not only was never addressed and redressed, but that the same oppressive tactics communities experienced decades ago were being used in the current mo moment, that white supremacy and heteropatriarchy were manifesting in the same ways as they had in the past, that oppression that community elders had experienced as young people was happening to young people in their communities again now. But all is not lost. Across communities and identities, users of these community archives also articulated conceptions of archives as spaces to connect past injustice with contemporary activism and future possibilities, and saw their own involvement in archives as an active disruption of those oppressive cycles. So I'm going to share with you some of the things people said in these focus groups so you get a really lucid picture of what I mean. And I will quote them by name here. They gave us permission to do so. And I think it's important to acknowledge the role of these focus group participants in the creation of knowledge. Um, the focus groups were conducted right after the US presidential election, so the fear and uncertainty were palpable. So at Lambda Archives, Frank Stefano, a community elder and board member, spoke about how many younger um, LGBTQ people who came of age during the Obama administration might not yet see the political significance of their identity. They might think, quote, so what, you're gay, who cares, end quote. However, in Frank's eyes, their identity would take on new meaning as their rights were retrenched, and that's his word, under the new administration. Drawing a chilling parallel, Paul Detweiler, a filmmaker in his 40s, who was also part of that focus group, responded to Frank, Quote, I thought all the queers in the Weimar Republic probably thought things were fine. They were like, this is great. We're having a great time. We can do whatever we want. We're free. And then it's like, kaboom. Edith Benkoff, a professor teaching a queer history class, responded. I have the quotes up here at length. Um, you know, I always teach the history of the Weimar Republic. And I was teaching that the night of the election. And I was like, well, guys, this is really interesting. But I'm really not talking about Trump. I'm talking about Hitler. It was very freaky, it was very, very freaky. But I think when we came back the next week and all of these folks came back and said, this sounds like last week's lecture. And I said, yeah, you know, these things swing back and forth. So you have to kind of keep in mind that society may have changed, uh, may have seemed really wonderful, but just like the good old Weimar Republic, things changed. A sense of terror and dread, the realization of how bad things might get, given how awful histories repeat themselves, really permeated the room that night. Yet users of Lambda Archives also spoke of archives as sites of potential, and I want to stress here potential, political action. For Angela Risi, a recent college graduate, archival materials can inspire new activism and teach key political strategies from the past. She said, we have the collection of Associated Student Council meeting minutes. And so I went into those that week and I found the meeting minutes of when the Gay Liberation Front was proposed to be passed as a recognized student organization and it was approved. That was a really neat thing to find. That was one thing I was really impressed by, especially with activism happening today. I think that people think that activists who came before our time were this entity that had power and control and were official. But the records show it's just a handful of people to get together and scribble some things down on a notepad and that it evolves into something you never could have foreseen 
I don't know if activists are currently using the archives, but I think certainly one way that they could use it is just as pure motivation to believe in the work that they're doing and see it as important. And also to learn how activism has and hasn't been successful in the specific context of the city of San Diego. What tactics worked? What haven't? Or is there maybe a historic theme of police using certain strategies to try and regulate a movement, such as permits or raids or something like that? Angela also drew connections between anti-gay legislation from the past and Trump's current Muslim ban. She said, quote, I can't help but see the parallels between laws that Trump is putting into place. For example, the ban on people from the seven majority Muslim countries and how the administration is saying this isn't a Muslim ban, but it effectively works as a Muslim ban and how laws from the 50s and 60s were often explicitly anti-gay, but even if they weren't, they were crafted in a way to target the gay community. It's sneaky and manipulative, and it's been happening a long time." End quote. Angela, like many other focus group participants, suggested that communities turn to archives to learn about and from past activist strategies. Edith Benkoff concurred that activists should use the archives because, quote, the more you know about the past, You'll see things that are happening again, but we will know how to counteract things better if we see what has been done before, especially in our own community. At La Astoria Society, volunteer archivist Rosa Pena also tied her archival work to contemporary politics. She said, you don't realize how it repeats itself if you don't learn the history. If you don't know, even in like the 1940s, Americans that were of Mexican descent were sent back to Mexico. Like it could happen again this time, because it's like somebody that's searching for a Mexican is not going to see a Mexican American, just like they did back then. They're just going to round them up, just like they did with the Japanese. Jasmine de la Cruz, a young college student and volunteer, echoed Rosa's sense of the cyclical nature of time, but also added that archival work can help stop cycles of oppression. She said, like Rosa said, history repeats itself, but it can be stopped if you know the history. Today, mass deportation, Trump, all the stuff that's going on, people are just like, oh, they can't do that. But most of the stuff that's happening today, it's already been done. But they don't know that history because they don't come in through the door. The sense was if they did come in through the door, if the community made better and more activist use of the archives, they could learn how to combat state oppression. It's important to note here in both cases that the activist use was more imagined than actual. There's this wistful sense of potential to intervene, for archives to intervene in this way, rather than actual concrete evidence of them intervening. I'll give you one more empirical example. At Little Tokyo Historical Society, Steve Nagano talked about the importance of community elders who had survived incarceration as children, speaking about their experiences in light of recent Islamophobia. He said, part of the story of internment has been covered up because of the cultural thing to not talk about negative things. But it was a bad experience that we don't want to happen to other people. We don't want that same mistake happening to Muslims after 9-11. I feel like it's really sort of honorable that the elders are talking about internment so much now because that's helping Muslim people to fight the Muslim ban. So it's like even more of an honorable thing to do even though it's culturally uncomfortable. Again, connecting past oppression to contemporary oppression as a form of interruption into that historical cycle. So here we see again and again across sites, members of marginalized communities themselves articulating this repetition of history, the cyclical nature of oppression, connections being made between oppression their own community has experienced or is experiencing and that of other communities, and a kind of longing for archives and archivists and archival labor to intervene for remembering and documenting and preserving and storytelling as a way to break that cycle. So what does all of this mean for us as archivists, right? So I also have an archivist hat um, through my work with South Asian American Digital Archive. How do we tap into this largely unrealized potential for archival labor to intervene and disrupt white supremacy and heteropatriarchy? So these are questions I have been asking myself and really questions that since the presidential election in the US in 2016 have really kept me awake at night. It's a strange moment to be an archivist. It's not a preserving traces of the past for the future kind of moment, which I've argued for in the past, claiming community archives help us imagine new possible futures. It's more of a what in the F are we even doing this for kind of moment. The standard liberal archivist answers, collect more, collect more diversely, collect social movements as they arise, 
conduct outreach to diverse user groups, all of which I have also advocated for in the past. Um, do little to answer that all-important question of why are we even doing this, when in the American context so many of our most vulnerable community members are being deported, incarcerated, criminalized, impoverished, intimidated, assaulted, harassed, and murdered? Why preserve traces of the past for the future, when the future is wholly uncertain due to environmental degradation and the looming threat of nuclear war? Why preserve traces of the past when the intervention is needed in the now? Why preserve these traces in the middle of an urgent political crisis? So I don't come here today with easy answers, and indeed I think we should be suspicious of easy answers. Um, but it's clear to me that we need more radical interventions, more systemic changes, more direct action to disrupt white supremacy and heteropatriarchy. Archival interventions can be key in this disruption, but we need to move beyond these standard archival solutions of diverse collecting and inclusive description and instead move towards seismic structural shifts. So now I want to tell you about two small projects, and they're very small and in their nascent stages, that I've been working on since 2016 that I think might give us glimpses of a path ahead, a path of disruption, a path of intervention. These projects are not about the past, and they're not even about the future. They're about the now. That is the liberatory affects and effects of archival labor in the present. I hope they illustrate the possibilities for archival disruption in time and space. One is a graphic tool used to identify and dismantle white supremacy in archives that I'm sure some of the students are familiar with um, in this room. And the other, a participatory digital project on documenting Islamophobia. So the first project is based on an exercise I do with my Intro to Archives students, and that I did in a session entitled Identifying and Dismantling White Supremacy in Archives at the Society of American Archivists annual meeting last year. Here's how it works. I pass out copies of Peggy McIntosh's White Privilege Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack. How many of you know that piece? Many of you, fantastic. Um, if you haven't read it, read it. The piece consists of a list of 50 white privileges um, that is unearned assets and assurances that white people enjoy. Things like, I can go shopping alone most of the time, pretty well assured I will not be followed or harassed. Um, I can talk with my mouth full and not have people put this down to my color. I am never asked to speak for all of the people of my racial group. So as a group, we read these privileges out loud. And then I put up giant post-it notes. And my students know when I have the giant post-it notes up that I like mean serious business is about to happen, right? Um, so I put up the post-it notes where I write various aspects of archival work, things like appraisal, description, education, outreach, professional life. And then collectively for each archival area, we generate lists of privileges. And I have just some of, of them up here. So things like, when I look for materials from my community and archives, they'll be described in the finding aid and catalog records using language we use to describe ourselves. Um, materials are described using my native language. Under appraisal, I can be sure I can find materials representing people of my race, created by people of my race. I can assume archives will be committed to the preservation of materials from my community. Um, and then for each privilege we generate, we generate ways to dismantle that privilege, right? So things like implement policies to collect materials representing and created by people of color, um, contact archivists at your local repository and tell them you want to use collections created by people of color, um, demonstrate commitment to those communities through relationship building and power sharing over time, right? Um, I had the privilege of having Grayson Brillmeyer in my class uh, that year. And they created this fantastic poster to accompany the exercise. Um, they designed the poster in two ways. One is a giant PDF, which you see here. And other, uh, another way, as an easy to print 8.5 by 11 inch chunks, right? So easy to print sheets that um, anyone with access to a regular standard format printer could print out and assemble. So the poster is meant to be printed and distributed and hung up as a visual reminder of our obligation to dismantle white supremacy in archives. Kind of like those Heimlich maneuver posters you see in New York City restaurants, right? The comparison is actually apt. This is like a Heimlich maneuver poster. It will not teach you how to perform open heart surgery, right? We need open heart surgery, but immediately uh, we need the Heimlich maneuver, right? Um, so these posters are available in an article I wrote in Library Quarterly. It's also available on Grayson's website, and I have the URL up there. Um, I distributed 100 copies of this poster at the Society of American Archivists annual meeting last year. 
And people have been tweeting these fabulous pictures of the poster hung up in their repositories. And I just took a photo of it hung up in Jennifer's office. Um, the story of the backlash that happens when you talk about dismantling white supremacy at SAA is a story for another time. You can ask me about it in the Q&A if you're interested. Um, I will say here that despite intimidation and the failure of the professional association to act, in the face of such intimidation, under some bogus guise of neutrality and a gross misunderstanding of free speech, I'm still standing here today talking about dismantling white supremacy, and I intend to continue to do so. Um, but this poster is just the beginning. If this is the end point, I will have failed, we will all have failed. Um, I want more pedagogical exercises, more tools, more visual reminders of our ethical obligations as archivists to dismantle uh, systems of oppression. So the poster's the first step. The next step will be more structural, right? Um, I think as a white person, I have a white responsibility to educate myself and others about systems that benefit us and to act on ways to dismantle them and dream up alternatives, right? So as a white person I'm speaking, we created this mess. We have a responsibility to clean it up. Um, with my wonderful graduate students and other junior faculty at other archival studies programs, we're starting to create a website archivistsagainstwhitesupremacy.com that will build such tools. So we're just getting started. Check back there soon. There's nothing there yet. If any of you are interested in contributing, this is an all hands on deck kind of thing, um, please contact me. We need new ideas for us to think about starting from scratch, right? So one exercise that I'm coming up with right now is what would liberation in archives look like? And after we think about what that liberation would look like, how do we get there? Right? How do we start from scratch? How do we work backwards to get to that end point of liberation? Um, so the second project I want to talk about is in its nascent stage as well. So as Jennifer mentioned, 10 years ago, I helped co-found the South Asian American Digital Archive, or SADA, with Samit Malik. Um, it's an online-only community archive that preserves the history of immigrants to the US from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, and the Maldives. I was a board member for many years, and I sp still spend much of my time volunteering for the organization as an archivist, digitizing collections, and as a grant writer. We are fortunate enough to have received a small 8,000 euro grant from the German government agency GIZ to start a participatory project to document South Asian American experiences with Islamophobia. We were able to secure the grant because, as Jennifer mentioned, I participated in this Nelson Mandela Foundation dialogue series for memory workers that was funded by GIZ and had seed money for participants to launch projects. The Documenting Islamophobia project is complicated. All South Asians in the US, regardless of religion, are subject to Islamophobia due to the perception or misperception that they are Muslims. At the same time, Islamophobic thinking is not uncommon among South Asian Americans who are not Muslim, who are Hindu, for example. So how do we create a project that doesn't further divisions within the vast and artificial umbrella of South Asian American? It's also an enormous task. Where to begin when Islamophobia is so prevalent? Who or what gets included? Do we start at 9-11 or with Trump or much earlier? Is Islamophobia a contemporary category that we're imposing on the past? And if so, does it matter? So what? The ethical issues are also daunting. How do we create a project that does not invite further surveillance on communities that have already been subject to intense surveillance since 2001? And what is my own role as a white woman outsider? When to listen and when to act? These are huge questions that could not easily be answered, certainly not by me alone, nor by Samit Malik, who's Sada's co-founder and executive director. So we've put together a participatory project assembling an advisory board of those most impacted by Islamophobia. Ask them to help us answer these questions, and then use the grant money to compensate them for their labor. It's a painstaking process, and we have just begun it. Our assumptions going into the project have changed um, from listening to these advisory board members. Instead of documenting the past, which is what we thought we would be doing, um, the advisory board has directed us to activate records from the past that are already in our collection for use in the present. So we're working on a beta project now where the advisory board members are recording video narratives of themselves discussing records already in SADA's collection, contextualizing the records, activating those records, and talking about how those records relate to their own contemporary experiences. Um, 
As we work closely with the advisory board to decide the contours of the project, it's becoming clear to me that it's about the process more than the product. This is a shift in archival thinking and not just an inversion of the more product, less process trope, which honestly has always been a stand-in for the encroachment of neoliberalism in the profession. Again, we can talk more about that in the Q&A if you'd like. Um, but the project is about the process of this amazing group of activists and artists and academics, all survivors of Islamophobia to some extent, coming together and deciding what from the past is of value to the present. For the cathartic moment of documenting their own experiences, for representing themselves now, for building community in the present with others who have experienced similar oppression. My role is clearly to shut up and do the work. And here's my advice for white archivists and white archivists in training. Learn when to speak out. For example, when speaking out against white supremacy to people in positions of power. And learn when to shut up and do the work. For example, completing the unglamorous tasks of scanning and creating metadata spreadsheets and adding up budgets and grant proposals for projects that empower people of color. It's tricky to know the difference. You will make mistakes. I make mistakes all the time. But do not do nothing. Do not critique yourself out of action. Doing the work, the nitty gritty, unglamorous work, the work of archives can be anti-racist practice. So both of these projects, Archivists Against White Supremacy and Documenting Islamophobia, forge a liberatory now. They are for us now. They're not for some vague future that might never come. They help us to change our actions in the present, because that's all we have for certain. They aim to disrupt oppressive cycles, to intervene in the cyclical nature of oppression, to start creating different possibilities right here, right now. So what does this mean for archival practice? I know archivists are always looking for like tangible, practical solutions. Um, again, I don't think there are simple solutions here, but I think it's clear from the focus groups that members of marginalized communities want more overtly political activations of the archives. Representation for marginalized groups is always already political, but a more robust archival record is not enough. A simple step as archivists is to conduct outreach to activists create activist and residency programs, hold workshops to connect them to past movements, help them learn, learn what strategies worked and what failed. We are starting to do that at SADA, and we found there's a lot of overlap between artists in residency programs and activists in residency programs. But as a field, we need to be unapologetic in using our archival skills for structural change. In the American context, this means using our skills as archivists to end the state-sponsored murder and mass incarceration of black people, to work for material reparations for black communities, and to end the continued genocide and displacement of indigenous people, to dismantle systems of white supremacy, to act actively resist the oppression of the most vulnerable amongst us, and to re-envision forms of justice that repair and restore rather than violate and harm individuals and communities. You all will have to tell me what this looks like in the Canadian context, but I know we share a history of unrepaired settler colonialism that you in the Canadian archival community are starting to address in ways well beyond what is happening in the United States right now. So I hope in the past 30 minutes I've both intervened on simplistic notions of historical progress and galvanized you as archivists in training to embrace a more activist agenda during these times of political and social crisis. Together, we can make meaning of our work and make it relevant, make it disruptive and transformative. Together, we can break cycles of oppression. Harness your archival skills for reparation and liberation. I want to leave you with a quote from another focus group participant, Dorothy Fujita Roney, who's a professor of Asian American Studies at University of California at Irvine. She's a user of the Southeast Asian Archive there, an expert in American military intervention in Southeast Asia, and also an Indonesian American. I asked her, what is the role of archives in the current political crisis? And this is her response. And it's, I know it's long, but it's worth uh, repeating. I think it's a journey that we're moving through to figure it out. And I think that's why the Southeast Asian archives is so important, not just to protect things that we know would be thrown away otherwise. That is this incredible strategic intervention. We're preserving it for the next generation, right? But at the same time also, the archive is a politically generative space that enables us to continue this kind of dialogue and debate, that it's not about easy answers. I think the archive is really a space of considerable power, and part of it is because it is this repository from the artifacts and the books 
that someone can come in and really be drawn in, really have a life-changing moment. What could be more profound than to be able to connect with a part of your past that isn't talked about? But then to be able to move that forward to a dialogue. So I think the political project with Southeast Asian Americans is being really articulated now. The archive is a politically generative space in different ways for different communities. But fundamentally, I would really argue the history preserved in the Southeast Asian archive is part of the US national story. It is. You cannot understand the United States without understanding this. And you cannot understand our now unless you understand all that we have collected. But it is the process, the quote unquote moving through to figure it out, the now, the interruption in the cycle, that break in time that I think we need to focus our energies on at this moment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. We have um, quite a bit of time for questions. I think this talk is being recorded, and anything that isn't spoken into the mic will not be picked up. So I'm going to ask if you have a question, I will come to you with the mic and to speak into the, into the mic. All right, Sasha. Um, I was wondering if you could talk more about community archives and um, especially with groups who are in danger of being surveyed uh, under surveillance. So sort of like how to make space for those memories and those records, but not putting anyone more at risk. Yep. That's a great question. Um, I think there's a simplistic notion um, in the archives world that since uh, as archivists, we've done such a bad job creating an inclusive record that the solution to that is like go out and collect more um, from communities that have been left out. And that, uh, I think that's a good first effort, but I think we need to be more nuanced than that, right? Because as you have said, um, a lot of communities have, are under surveillance. A lot of communities um, don't want to share um, the, their histories, certainly with outsiders. Um, a lot of communities are, um, have experienced such harm from colonial knowledge extraction, right, that um, they're not interested in, in sharing with the wider community. Um, I think it's a question of context and relationship building and actually asking communities what they want and listening and then building systems that incorporate um, what they want. So it's um, an active listening process. In some cases, it will cause us to rethink the very basics um, of archival practice. Um, in some cases, it will mean not collecting and accepting no as an answer. Um, so recently, with the South Asian American Digital Archive, we were offered uh, for digitization. So we uh, are not a, phys a physical repository. We're a post-custodial online-only archive. So we borrow materials from individuals, from families, from organizations. We digitize them. We make them available, and then we return them. So everything so far that we have in our collection is publicly accessible. There's no like secret SADA archive somewhere. Um, so recently we were offered materials um, related to a gay and lesbian uh, South Asian American organization from the 1990s, newsletters, photographs. Um, and we really want those materials. Those are really valuable, important historical materials. Um, as a community archive, we're constantly being reflective about our own practice and also always asking, well, who are we leaving out of the story, right? So our goal is not just to counter a dominant narrative with another big D dominant narrative, but to create these messy spaces for multiple and conflicting narratives. Um, and uh, South Asian American gay and lesbian history is underrepresented in the materials we have so far. But as we were looking through the materials that were offered to us, we realized there are the names and photographs of people outing them and they might be people who are not outed to their families and who might not be outed to their families back home in South Asia, and that that could in fact have real violent consequences for them. And so in this case, we had a long conversation about it, Samip and I, and decided we're not digitizing these materials. Um, we thought about redacting them, but it seemed to um, further another act of epistemic violence to black out someone's name or put a box over someone's face, right? And so. In that case, the answer is no. Um, and there will be many cases where the answer is no. Um, I was actually just writing about this 
uh, writing an article where Marika C4 and I had written this article about radical empathy in archives and applying a feminist ethics of care to archives based on webs of relationships. And Marika and I were just working on an article about what this looks like in the digital realm. And I was writing this article, I realized I was recounting the same anecdote I just told you, and I realized consent is a feminist principle, right? And listening when people say, no, that's a basic fundamental uh, fun feminist thing to do, right? So, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, but it's, it's listening and participation and changing your preconceived notions and um, also being flexible. What works for one community is not gonna work for another. What works in one particular historic moment might not work in the future. Um, you know, I wish I had like simple guidelines to say, here's how you do it, one, two, three, but as in all things archives, right, it depends. You know, sure. Um, I was wondering if you could expand a little bit on the activist in residence um, program, like what that actually looks like. Yeah, thank you for asking that question. I had like a section on it that I didn't have time for that got cut out. Um, so last year, South Asian American Digital Archives successfully got this grant um, from the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage to launch an artist, an artist in residency project. And so what we did is we commissioned five South Asian American artists to create artwork based on material in the archive. And then we had an event where they publicly unveiled the material that they had created. Um, this was an event in Philadelphia last spring, a year ago. Um, and what we found was that the artwork was absolutely amazing, exceeded our wildest imaginations of what people would do with the archival materials, um, was very personally gratifying because we are an online only post-custodial archive. I never have a face-to-face -face interaction with a user, right? So I never know who's using the kinds of materials that I've spent all of these hours digitizing and describing. Um, and to see the records activated in that way was just, it made all the past 10 years worthwhile. Um, that said, the most important and moving pieces were political pieces. So um, we had a sound artist, Zain Alam, who is the front man of this uh, rock hip hop band called Hamesha. Hamesha means always or forever in Hindi and Urdu. Um, and what he did is he had picked um, of Sada's collection, <coughs> excuse me, he had picked, we have silent eight home uh, movie super eight footage that was taken by someone named Sharonjit Singh Dillon who came to the United States from the Punjab region of India in 1956 to study at the University of Oklahoma. Um, this 1956 beautiful, full color, moving image, silent moving image of his wedding ceremony. He married a white woman from Oklahoma. Um, and then the next five years of raising his children in Norman, Oklahoma. Um, and it's beautiful, striking footage. It's footage that Sumit and I have both described as uh, what we had previously thought would be impossible footage. We didn't think there were any moving images of South Asians in this time period. So US immigration law changes in 1965 and there's more um, Indian immigrants. But prior to, in between 1923, uh, 1946 and 1965, there was um, uh, only 100, uh, a quota of 100 Indians a year were allowed in the United States. So we didn't think we would find this kind of material. So seeing the materials, it's a very effectively moving material. So Zayn picked that footage and created a score to the silent footage and then remixed the silent footage. And he mixed it in with um, footage from CNN that was documenting hate crimes against Sikhs and Muslims in the United States. Um, and uh, the presentation of this piece at the SADA event last year coincided with, uh, well, a few months later in August, the fifth anniversary of um, a, an event in which a neo-Nazi gunman stormed a Sikh Gurdwara in Oak Creek, Wisconsin and killed six people. So he intermixed this um, historic 1956 footage with um, the CNN footage of hate crimes. Um, and created this amazingly beautiful haunting score. These are all available on the SADA website. If you click on uh, artists where we belong, you can uh, see the image. 
Um, it's a very um, moving piece emotionally, but it's also a very political piece. And in Zane's presentation, he did an interview with National Public Radio about it as well. He talked about, again, this idea that um, there's this assumption that we're making progress in this country, but that in fact, um, the, that video footage from 1956 might in fact show two steps forward, three steps back. That in fact, maybe things were easier in 1956 for this immigrant. Um, in Norman, Oklahoma than they might be today. Um, and so that was for me a very political activation of the record. Um, one other piece was this jazz saxophone player, Rudresh Mahantapa, who took, we have footage in the archive of Groucho Marx's You Bet Your Life show, and he had a contestant um, on the show, um, Kuldeep Singh Ray, who was actually a medical student at UCLA. This was also like 1954 and 1955, the same time period. And Kuldeep Singh Ray goes on the You Bet Your Life show and um, has this very racist back and forth with Groucho Marx, where Groucho Marx is asking him, like, did you ride on a camel here? Um, and Kuldeep Singh Ray is playing into those racist stereotypes and kind of egging him on for laughter, right? And there's a laugh track. Um, for the piece. Um, so um, what the jazz saxophone player did was create this uh, sound installation that remixed um, those very uncomfortable moments of dialogue between Groucho Marx um, and Kuldeep Singh Ray and played saxophone over them in ways that highlighted the tension. And the conversation that ensued in the event was a very political conversation where it was, the audience was mostly second generation South Asian Americans. And the conversation was about their own parents playing into those Orientalist racist stereotypes as a way of fitting in, as a way of not rocking the boat. Um, and how the second generation felt um, so uncomfortable listening to this, but also feeling the need to push back and resist against that. Um, and so those were artistic interventions, but they were very, very political. Um, I have not heard of that many other um, community archives having, officially having activists in residencies, um, but I think that's where we're moving for SADA, um, moving ahead with SADA, and I think it's something we wanna apply for grant funding for because you know, like all community archives, we struggle very much financially, right? We probably spend more time fundraising than we do collecting materials. Um, but that, that also, um, the financial independence is, also means our autonomy, right? It means we're community-based. Um, so I think that is our next step. We know that there are activist groups who have used materials in the archive. Um, so there's uh, something called Bay Area Solidarity Summer, or BASS, which is like a two-week activist training camp for South Asian American high school students um, and youth, and they have used materials in the archive as well. Um, but again, we find out about this anecdotally because we're online only. Um, so I think we need, we need these more formal projects, more formal programs, but also the activists need to get funded to do them. So this is another kind of conundrum that community archives find themselves in operating within this neoliberal mode, but also acknowledging that people deserve to be paid for their labor, right? It's a good question. Thank you. Um, I have a twofold question. Um, I wanna go back to what you said earlier about the cycles. Um, I was thinking that national narratives of victimization, say in Russia, where uh -huh after the USSR fell apart. People today pine for that era of glory in Russia. Yeah. And that's not so much like marginalized folks, yeah. but more like the majority. And Putin yeah. is trying to push that. So, and, and I can also cite an example from my home country in Morocco where I, I always thought that uh, Morocco was included the Sahara. It was only when I left the country that I saw that it was practically cut in half. Um, these narratives are really, really strong. Yeah. And saying that community archives can help, I, I want to believe that. <laughs> but it's just that sometimes you're fighting against these national narratives yeah. that are so strong and where the, the state plays such a huge role. Like in Morocco, I can't I know, I know maybe five archives in the whole country, but like community... Uh, 
social groups are trying to help, but you're fighting against this mentality of people thinking the benevolence of the state is what will help us. Yep. And then my other question is, how can community archives intervene in this era where, say, in uh, Western countries, um, Reddit and people use all these other blogs um, or like have these kind of little groups and they, they f spawn these counter narratives yeah. of what's going on and how they've been wronged. Um, how, how can community archives help? I mean, yes, there's this wishful thinking that people will resort to archives more because of all the lies everywhere and because they want to verify information, but that's insufficient. Um, yeah, thank you. Yep. <laughs> thank you. H two huge questions. I wish I could just say yes and no, but no. Um, more complicated than that. Um, so you're absolutely right, right? The national narratives are really powerful. And in the US, um, nostalgia, uncritical nostalgia, right, plays a huge role. If you think about, uh, you know, Trump's um, election slogan, make America great again. It's like buying into this nostalgia that there was some Eden that we have since fallen from, right? Um, I think, in, and this is here's where my being hopelessly American kind of comes into play, that uh, for other communities, other times, other places in the world, um, the conditions are not possible for community archives. So two weeks ago, I was in Doha, Qatar, um, I was invited by my friend Sumeya Ahmed, who's a professor of library and information studies at University College London, has a campus in Doha. And so Doha is, um, Qatar is a place where the Qatari citizens are extremely wealthy from oil money. But 90, 85 to 90 percent of the population are migrant workers from South Asia and Southeast Asia. And so she asked me um, to give a talk about South Asian American digital archive. Um, which she called, like, do the nice white lady version of this, like, show them that it's possible uh, to document South Asian American experiences. Um, but, and then I also gave a workshop on building a community archive. And at the workshop, um, I had people from other immigrant groups, but there were no South Asians there at the workshop. Because the conditions are not possible for a group of people who have no rights who are also working insane hours, right? They work 14-hour days. Um, you usually have Fridays off. But um, it's not politically possible for them to document their own histories in a public way. Maybe they're doing it privately. I don't know. Um, but it's just not, the conditions are just, it's just not politically possible to do that there. Um, and so for me, that was really eye-opening, right? That, um, my uh, sense of understanding about community archives is so forged in my own particular context um, where it is possible. It is possible to document your own histories. Um, I also got the question when I was there of um, how is SADA contributing to a national narrative? How are you changing the national narrative? And I think for the past 10 years, um, we have been really focused on just collecting the stuff for the community, right? That's our primary audience. Um, to get the community to see and to know more about how they've actually been in existence for more than 100 years and that there's a long history of political activism, for example, right? That really counters these harmful racist myths about South Asian Americans as model, either model minority or the flip side terrorists, right? Um, that our focus has been on that and not on a national narrative. That doesn't mean that won't change over time, right? But that's what our focus has been on. Um, your second question about Reddit and blogs and social media is a really good one. Um, I think most people don't know, at least in my own context, if you ask the average person walking down the street, they have no idea what archives are. Um, when they do think of what an archive is, they think like their website that has their previous postings is an archive, right, which it's not. Um, and so there's, you know, huge misconceptions. Um, I'll use the term, some archives have been symbolically annihilated, right, that, you know, misrepresentations, misconceptions, just absences about what archives are. Um, there's this really amazing project called Documenting the Now, 
that has been organized by Burgess Jewels and Ed Summers. That's a collaborative effort between Washington University in St. Louis, uh, University of California, Riverside, and University of Maryland. That is, um, that started out really thinking about how can we archive tweets related to the Ferguson protests and Black Lives Matter protests um, more broadly. And Burgess Jules has spoken very eloquently about noticing this disconnect between how the Ferguson protests in particular were reported in the news media and then seeing his Twitter feed of people who were on the ground at the protests, how different those narratives were. And thinking about how if we don't start collecting those tweets, this is going to be lost, right? We won't know these histories. Um, but what that project quickly discovered is that there are ethical issues in terms of surveillance and consent, right? So just because you can technically harvest millions of tweets doesn't mean you should, particularly when we're in an era where police are, are using social media for surveillance, right? To pick out um, and target protesters, right? Just distinct people protesting. Um, and so what, what Burgess, excuse me, and the others quickly realized, excuse me, <coughs> is that consent is consent, right? Whether it's an analog record or a digital record. <coughs> you wouldn't acquire, acquire someone's physical papers without getting their consent. So why would you do that with the tweet? even if you could, right? And so um, that team, the Documenting the Now team, is developing really sophisticated ways of getting consent on a mass scale. Um, and I think that's you know, a really important question moving ahead, is how, how do we build an ethics of consent and relationship building, uh, uh, an ethics of flexibility, right, that's not one size fits all, that's not um, cookie cutter that acknowledges cultural difference, that acknowledges political circumstances, right? That acknowledges that risks are not equally meted out um, in our society. Um, figuring out how to do that. I'm going to drink lots of water while you ask your questions. It's actually, one o'clock now. So if, if anybody does need to sneak out, um, Please feel free to sneak out, um, but we'll, we'll take another question. Um, I just had a question kind of based on <coughs> what you just said, because talking about sort of the ethics um, of sort of gathering people's information and, and maybe not just their materials, but also their knowledge then when we're doing um, arranging and describing, mm -hmm. where does that information go? I've always been kind of interested in the idea of like putting our methodology in our finding aids, but uh -huh. that would kind of require rethinking sort of archival practice as research, and that has lots of other sort of uh, ethical questions. So that's kind of something that I've been wondering about, and I wonder if you have as well. Yeah. So this is something we're having a conversation about right now um, at SADA. So we recently scanned um, a collection of scrapbooks from someone named Amarjit Singh Marwa who came from India also in the 1950s as a dentist, and then um, opened up a dental practice in Los Angeles, became the dentist to the Hollywood stars, became like close friends with Elizabeth Taylor, and then became part of Mayor Tom, Bra Tom Bradley, was the first African American mayor of LA, um, became part of Mayor Tom Bradley's Rainbow Coalition, and became the Cultural Affairs Commissioner for Los Angeles, and a huge philanthropist. Um, and he's 93 years old right now. And uh, so we digitized these scrapbooks. He lives in Malibu. And when you're looking through the scrapbooks with him, it's an entirely different experience than if you're just looking through them on your own, right? So um, they are, there's probably, I don't know, 50 scrapbooks. And they are full of photographs of him with famous Hollywood stars from the 1980s and Bollywood stars and politicians. And I'm old enough to be able to recognize like who was on Dallas and Knott's Landing in the 80s, right? But my students don't know who Larry Hagman is, so my students were just like, I don't know who that is. Digitized it, but didn't you know know the significance? Where I'm like, oh my God, that's Zsa, Zsa Gabor, right? Um, and so we're think, and this is kind of a lighthearted example, but we're thinking about um, finding ways to videotape Dr. Marwa describing his own materials. 
to recreate the experience of going through those scrapbooks with him. Um, so a partici it's participatory, just not in terms of the general public participating, but participatory in terms of um, you know, the donor of the materials participating more actively in the description of those materials. Um, so that's one way um, that we're thinking about doing it. Um, but it's, it's slow work and again relies on volunteer labor in the community archives context. So um, it's, it's a good question. Do you have ideas for how you would do that? I wrote a really good paper on this topic <laughs> last year. <laughs> Well, just sort of rethinking sort um, the finding aid and sort of yeah. what that is. To me, a finding aid is a product of archival research or maybe even uh, for community archives, doing focus groups, doing interviews. Um, and so I think treating it that way and putting in a methodology section yeah. and saying, you know, I did a focus group, I did an ethics review yeah. to do this focus group, and then this is how I arranged it and described it based on my findings. Um, yeah. But that, that requires completely <laughs> reshifting sort right. of the thought process behind archival processing. And yeah. so I don't know how catching that would be. Right. What about a statement about your own positionality? <laughs> yeah, I think that's definitely important, like reflexivity always in the finding aid. But, but even just sort of saying, you know, my methodology of describing this archive was content analysis, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think we don't think to say that ever. Right. Um, we think about it only in terms of when we're doing sort of bigger, like I was saying, focus groups, interviews, outside research. Um, or maybe we don't even think about it then, but um, just always kind of having that as almost like a section in the yep. rules for archival description, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yep. I mean, I think there is a shift happening in archival studies and this is um, a lot based on the work of Elizabeth Yackel and also that brilliant, my favorite archival studies article ever by Wendy, Wendy Duff and Vern Harris called Stories and Names um, about archival description. But shifting to think about archival description as like a discrete act that uh, you do and then it's done and then you move on to the next, describing the next collection. Um, but as this ongoing, shifting, culturally located situation that's bound by time, by the archivist, by the whole cultural situation. Um, and that shifts it to thinking about an ongoing process. Now that's overwhelming given how much backlog we have, right? Um, and I, I, I only can think about solutions to that kind of problem on a more structural level. So on the structural level of like advocate uh, for the importance of archives in society so that people will fund us so that we can pay archivists to do these kinds of uh, detailed, contextual, ongoing, descriptive, descriptive work, right? Um, in SADA, we don't have anything called a finding aid, right? Our description is not our strongest suit. Again, we've been spending so much time just collecting the materials and ensuring our material survival as an organization. Um, and everything would, would and is minimally, but described at an item level. Right, so now we're going back and writing collection level descriptions, but they're not finding aids in any kind of traditional sense. Um, and as you know, God, when you ask the average person on the street, they don't know what archives are. They certainly don't know what a finding aid is, right? Um, so perhaps it's, it's us letting go of, of the structures that have been in place for so long, calling it something else, right? My uh, students always say, I teach archival use and users, and they're like, why don't we call it a guide, like a lib guide? Like, yeah, a guide is more self-explanatory than a finding aid. Oh. Okay, I think we had better stop there. For students, <laughs> um, we have this room booked from five to six um, this evening, so if you're able to come back, we'll just have kind of a chat. Um, but I would like to say a very big thank you to Michelle um, for coming and sharing her work with us. You. This is the Slace Umbrella. Oh, fantastic. Yes. Thank you so much. You need it, yeah. <laughs> this is so great. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Okay.